Welcome to the Speak Up Talk Radio Network. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. We bring you hand-selected hosts, podcasts, and talk radio programming with listening options, 24-7 streaming, or listen on demand. We also feature one-on-one segments with important guests, people who have something to say that you need to hear. And if you have something to say and would like to be featured on the network, please visit speakuptalkradio.com for all of the details or contact us at PR at speakuptalkradio.com. Well, today we opened with the familiar music, Dona Nobis Pachem, sung by today's author, Laurel A. Rockefeller. Born, raised, and educated in Lincoln, Nebraska, Laurel is author of over 20 books published and self-published since August of 2012, and in languages ranging from Welsh to Spanish to Chinese and everything in between. A dedicated scholar and biographical historian, Laurel is passionate about education and improving history literacy worldwide. With her lyrical writing style, Laurel's books are as beautiful to read as they are informative. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her cockatiels, traveling to historic places in both the United States and United Kingdom, and watching classic motion pictures and classic television series. Her favorites? Star Trek, Doctor Who, original Battlestar Galactica, and Babylon 5. And today, we are going to focus on her book series titled The Legendary Women of World History, celebrating the lives of inspiring women from around the world and across history. So let's get going. Welcome to the network, Laurel. Hi, Pat. How are you doing? I'm just doing fine today. You and I are both in uh, the eastern section of the United States, sweltering away. So um, it's a hot day, and we've got a lot of hot topics to talk about. So I think it's appropriate. Sounds good to me. Yep. You know, Laurel, I've I've done a lot of research on you, and you and I have talked on the phones. You are such a fascinating person. Your work is so intense and rich in labor and research and depth. I have seriously been waiting for our time together with quite a bit of anticipation, so I'm excited. Now, let's just dig right in. Your books are historical, and I think when most people hear of history books, I know mine usually does. It goes back to grade school or junior high or high school. And you remember memorizing dates and places. And sadly, the people and their stories never had the chance to shine. So what makes your books different? Well, it's narrative history. It's not the lists of the names and the places and all that stuff. Believe it or not, I don't have any better memory for this stuff than you do. So I'm really not that good at it. That's actually where the timelines in the book, starting with Catherine de Fahua, Boudicca does not have it because we simply don't know the dates. When you're talking about the so-called Celtic world, they didn't write anything down, so we don't know exactly when was when back then. But the timelines and a lot of these appendices that you see that make these books so unusual and so special... They really come from my needs as a writer and a researcher to keep track of all of it because I don't have a great memory for this stuff either. What makes my story so different is it's narrative. It's all about the story. You know, his story, it's not, it's not supposed to be about lists. It's supposed to be about stories. That's how we used to communicate stories about our past. We really, it was really more music and just reciting and just sharing what was interesting about what happened in the past. It makes it much more accessible when you focus on the story instead of the, the list of the facts. Because you can always look up the list of the facts. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. And I'm sure it's a little difficult as a researcher because you get so involved in the research and the facts and the dates and all of that. But then you obviously have the gift to make it narrative and clean and easier to understand. So, um, yeah, hats off to you for being able to do that. The data that I have is much more complicated than it comes off in the books. Mm -hmm. I really, I think I have a special gift for making very complicated ideas and events and and all these different pieces come together and make it very easy for people to understand. These books are really meant to be for really accessible no matter what your education level is or how old you are, where you live in the world, what your background is supposed to be accessible. And it's not intended for the people with PhDs in in history or, you know, the Ivy League schools and all that. It's not really for those people. It's for you and me. Mm -hmm. 
It's for our kids and our neighborhood and, and all that, no matter where we are. Absolutely. So what was it that made you decide to write about these women? Well, the funny story about the legendary women of world history, and you'll see this on my website. My website has got a lot of fun stuff on it. It's not like your typical author website where it's really focused on buy my book. It's just a lot of fun stuff. And we'll get on in, uh, into the website a little bit later, I'm sure. But what really got it was back in March of 2014, for those of you who are not in the United States, March is Women's History Month in the United States. And I just did a casual asking people, name five women from history or name 10 women from history, just casually asking them. And I was really shocked that better than 90% of people I asked could not name five women from history. It was worse than what you see on the late night, you know, like mm -hmm. the late night comics or whatever, they'll do that kind of walking around asking people to name, like who's the president of the United States, right. that kind of thing. I did a similar sort of thing. And I got really annoyed that people couldn't name five women from history. It didn't matter the time or place. It could be someone who was alive. They couldn't do it. I had one person tell me that the current queen of the United Kingdom was Queen Elizabeth the 23rd. I could you not. <laughs> so instead of getting just mad about it and doing it myself, I decided to do something about it. And the way that you deal with ignorance is you educate people. You share the stories so that they know it now and they can stop being ignorant and, not, and hopefully stop being less hateful and rude and so forth, all the things that really bother us all in society now. Oh, I love you. <laughs> We we talked about sugar coating earlier, didn't we? <laughs> yes, yes. None of that here, folks. Um, so why don't you share the titles of the books in your series? Okay, let's see if I can do this in order. <laughs> the first, <laughs> I know it's a challenge. Boudicca brings Queen of the Iceni. Boudicca, of course, lived in the first century of the Common Era. And she actually, I believe she was mentioned somewhere in my education, whether it was university, because I did have a dedicated course on women back in the university. And I think she was mentioned there. She is the national heroine of England, because she, uh, the Iceni were up in what's now modern day Norfolk, stuff like that, kind of that rule apart, East Anglia. Catherine de Valois, I got interested in her because of Shakespeare. And my favorite play is Henry V, until, of course, I wrote this biography and realized what rubbish Shakespeare was in terms of history. Next was, I believe it was Mary, Queen of the Scots. And, I, and after about a year, it received the subtitle, The Forgotten Reign, because there's so many books about Mary, Queen of Scots, and they all focus on what happened to her after mm -hmm. The, the issues with her marriages and after Jane, she had to abdicate to her son James. Those books tend to focus on that and her imprisonment and all that and really the, the sad, tragic parts. This one is really about her reign itself and what a beautiful, fantastic, amazing woman she was. And she was. So Mary, Queen of the Scots, The Forgotten Reign, followed by Queen Elizabeth Tudor, Journey to Gloriana which tells the story really of starting from about the age of five all the way to the death of Queen Mary Stuart. And what you'll find really fascinating about it is at the end of Queen Elizabeth Tudor, I actually used transcripts from Queen Mary's trial. So these two books are linked. So if you want to know how everything ended up for poor Mary, besides just the paragraph or two I give you at the end, you want to come back for Queen Elizabeth Tudor and you'll actually get a lot more details about her, about her trial in those final days. And, and I mean, Queen Mary Stuart was such a, a tragic figure, but she was also just an amazing woman. Then after that, it was Empress Wu Tien. Yes, I do speak EDN, EDN, the Zhongwan, a little bit of Chinese. I studied her back in, when I was in university at the University of Nebraska. I was an Asian history specialist. And Empress Wu was really fascinating because she, she reformed China by starting the civil service exam system. Before, it was very much a feudal monarchy. Mm -hmm. And under Empress Wu, she decided to, that the way to get rid of corruption was to level the playing field so that everyone took an examination and how you did on that examination. In other words, education is what decided whether, whether or not you got that government job. And that civil service exam system lasted all the way, really, until, until the People's Republic of China, you know, roughly around the 1950s, when that was finally abolished. So she has changed. She's probably changed the world more than any other woman I know of in history, just because how many billions of Chinese have there been 
since the late seventh century all the way to the present. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a completely different world because of Empress Ruth. So she's fascinating that way. Then I go back to the Middle Ages, medieval Europe, to the story of Gwen Sheehan from Griffith. And she is the national heroine of Wales. Uh, Gwen Sheen, uh, the, the book is called Gwen Sheen for Griffith, the Warrior Princess of the Haybar, and that's one of two titles in, available in Cymraeg, uh, in Welsh, mm-hmm. but because the other one that's in Welsh. And of course, that's a very fascinating story because, she, you know, why is she the national heroine of Wales? And I tell you that story, and it's a very tragic story, but you'll find this very interesting. Did you know that Prince William, you know, the, the House Windsor off in the UK, mm-hmm. he is Related to Gwen, he is a descendant of Gwen Sheehan by both his parents because oh. Diana, Princess of Wales, was descended of Gwen Sheehan for Griffith, and so is the house, so is House Windsor. Oh, did so not he know has that. on both sides, which is really fascinating, and Absolutely. you'll really want to hear that story, especially if you're curious about Prince William and Kate and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You have to find out about the, about her. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and that's not even finished. And I, then I believe that was. Book seven, and then the last one was Hypatia of Alexandria, and she was a brilliant scientist. She was probably the best-known scientist and most popular scientist of the late Roman Empire, and a lot of people think that she was murdered. She was murdered. This is a murder story over her sex, and that's certainly the point of view that's in the, the wonderful film called Agora, which I do suggest. It's a beautiful film. It's a, I suggest it as a beautiful film, but it's historically wrong because, well, that's Hollywood for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but Hypatia, uh, she was murdered at the age of 60, and so she had a roughly around a 40-year career. And, and by the way, don't quote me about 60 years old. It, it might have been 65, but I think she was 60. On, on that, yeah, it was. She was 60 at the time because she was born in 355 of the Common Era, and she was murdered in 415. Actually, on the eyes of March, oh, wow. March 15th, 415 C. So she died on the same day as same day of the year as Julie as Gaius Julius Caesar. Oh my, this is just so rich in information that most people don't know. And you know what caught my ear is when you gave us that little tidbit about Prince William. And that makes me think about bringing these people closer to home is is what you might want to call trivia. It's not really trivia, but, you know, some of these little known facts. So maybe share, because I find that fascinating. I know that our listeners will as well. Maybe share a little bit of these little known facts that could help bring these women closer to life. (laughs) Well, if you, the, the city is now called Colchester, which is, a, I believe, it's an Anglo-Saxon name. But the modern city of Colchester, it was called, in Welsh, it was called Cercolan, and the Romans called it Camulodia. Now, famously, the first thing that Boudicca did when she went on her, on her military campaign, and the reason why she went on the military campaigns is why you have to buy the book. You want to read that to see why. But she, burns, she burned the city to the ground. And what you may not know is that if you go to the city, if you go to Colchester, England, you will oftentimes see the very burn layer. There is a huge layer of ash that still remains after almost 2,000 years from when she burned the city to the ground. So that's fascinating. Wow. And a good reason to go to Colchester to check that out. Oh, my. Who knew that? <laughs> Catherine de Valois, I, I hinted to you that it was Shakespeare that brought me into that one. Mm-hmm. Everybody's heard of the Battle of Agincourt. Well, if you know Shakespeare's play, you get the feeling Battle of Agincourt happened, and boom, we're right to the Treaty of Troyes. Well, actually, there was a, quite a bit of time in between it. Catherine turned 14 years old just two days after the Battle of Agincourt. Her birthday was the 20, 27th, 28th. Someone's going to collaborate me on that, on the Battle of Agincourt. Mm-hmm. But that tells you, I don't remember the dates. I remember <laughs> close to it. But she turned 14. The Treaty of Troyes was in May of 1420, I believe. And the ultimate reason for the Treaty of Troyes had to do with the siege of Rouen, which is one of those horrible, horrible stories about the and just how bad of a person was Henry V. We, we really celebrate him, but we really shouldn't. He was a really nasty, nasty person. Let's go to Mary, Queen of Scots. She was the first Scottish monarch to spell her name, the family name Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, no. instead of Stuart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T. So all of her half-brothers, because her father, like, like most kings, her, her father had a number of children out of wedlock and with mistresses and so forth. 
And so all of her half-brothers and all of her predecessors, her father, all spelled it S-T-E-W-A-R-D. W-A-R-T. Sorry, let me spell this again. <laughs> S-T-E-W-A-R-T is the real original spelling. Now, what's really fascinating with the translation is, of course, other countries do not make, and other languages don't make the distinction oh. between those. So I always have to work with my translators and, and sort of like drive in their head. It matters. This was a significant historical mm-hmm. event that Mary changed the spelling of the name. Because Stuart is Stuart in French and Spanish and Italian. They spell it S-T-U-A-R-T. And they don't realize that it was a break. It was a big break. Oh, wow. Uh, which you may not realize that Mary was 5'11". She was one of the tallest people in media in Europe at the time. Mm. Forget about just royal women. She was one of the tallest people. Mm. She literally towered over everybody else. She was also considered one of the most beautiful women in all of 16th century Europe. So she was a looker. Her, her portraits actually allegedly don't give her justice at all. Uh, we talked about not sugarcoating. Mm-hmm. I have one exception to that. <laughs> Lord Darnley was so vulgar and so X-rated in his behavior and his speech that I had to edit him down. (laughs) And I put it, because I wouldn't let a 30-year-old know exactly the way that Darnley was. He was that bad. And I'm not going to swear, but (laughs) we can throw a whole bunch of Malcolm Tucker, for those of you who are Peter Capaldi fans, we can throw a whole bunch of Malcolm Tucker things and from, say, an entire series of the thick of it, and you would still not get to how bad Darnley was. So I had to tone him down. (laughs) See, who knew? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Queen Elizabeth. uh, Queen Elizabeth played a keyboard instrument called the Virginal. Actually, so did Queen Mary. It's like a a precursor to the harpsichord, which, of course, is a precursor to the pianoforte. Right. The Virginal she had that they found belonged to her mother, Anne Boleyn. And we know that it belonged to Anne Boleyn because it had painted on... It has. We still have it in a museum. It has painted... Anne Boleyn's personal heraldry as Queen of England, oh. right on the original, on a, I believe at least two places it has it. So she inherited that instrument from her mother. It was probably a very cherished possession for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing you may not know relating to Elizabeth is that you remember, everybody knows about Robert Dudley, right? The Earl of Leicester and how everybody hated him and all that. Right, right. Did you know that he was an older brother to Guildford Dudley, who was the husband to Lady Jane Grey. Uh, he was brother-in-law to Lady Jane Grey. Uh-huh. I already told you about Empress Wu and the feudal structure of China. Uh, you may not also know that she moved the capital of China from Chang'an, which is modern-day Xi'an. She moved it to Luoyang, which was, is, I believe, a big textile-producing center. So it was a very important city to the Silk Road. Guan Xian, she defended De Haybarth as the co-sovereign. So her husband was inherited the crown from his father, but she was given an equal status in terms of ruling. They ruled together for 20 years. Oh. Now, you think it's hard enough to rule a country, right? Mm-hmm. She gave birth to five sons and two daughters while she's doing this. And she was on campaign a great deal. So you think it's hard to be a mom. Try <laughs> bringing your kids along with you, your young children with you on horseback while you go fight an enemy invading your country. Exactly. <laughs> Stop complaining, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't complain. And then, of course, I already told you about uh, her descendants. These descendants come from her youngest son, Rees, who was only six years old at the time that, that Gwen Xi'an was executed. She has the distinction of being the, uh, the first monarch to be executed by the English. Now, this is when the Code of Chivalry is in place. So, basically, if you captured a monarch in battle, you were supposed to ransom them. Instead of ransoming them, Maurice de Londres put a, a log in front of her and beheaded her right on the, on the spot. It was not a good end for Gwen Xi, and that's a, one of the reasons why the Welsh are still upset in England. They're still mad about this, and this was February of 1136. Her descendants, through that son, Reese, the, the little boy she had to leave behind, includes Queen Elizabeth Tudor, Queen Mary Stuart, U.S. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Queen Elizabeth, and, of course, Diana, Princess of Wales. Do you want to hear about Matilda? Sure. Empress Matilda was the only one of her her parents' five children to outlive both her father and her mother, although her father had, I think, 26 bastard children, including one that was named Matilda. Uh, Matilda was doubly related to Gwen Sheen for Griffith through Nest, 
Gratian's husband, uh, Griffith F. Rees, had a sister who was born very close in, in, to the time she was, named Princess Nest. Princess Nest was a lover to Matilda's father, Henry, well, Henry the First. It became Henry the First of England, and Nest had a son. Henry Fitzhenry by Henry the First of England. So she was related to Gwen Sheen through marriage that way. And then one of Gwen Sheen's brother's grandsons married the mistress of Je uh, Geoffrey Plantagenet of Anjou. And, and that mistress and Geoffrey Plantagenet had a daughter together. So he, she was near direct married. She was related to Matilda that way. Oh, Matilda and Geoffrey hated each other so much that Matilda actually returned back to London from Anjou and stayed at the, uh, at the Tower of London. That's how badly they did not get along. You know, Eleanor of Aquitaine famously didn't get along with Matilda's son, Henry II. So this gives us reason to pick up your books. Anyone who's interested in history and thinks they know what's going on, you've obviously got the scoop here. And, and, you've, tra <laughs> and you've translated into so many languages as well. So no matter what somebody reads, you've got, you've got that pretty much covered. I think it's also in the order of six to eight languages. I could, you can go on my website. Uh, under For each book, I give you the cover art and the, the Kindle link to each and every one of them. So I think you'll be staggered. I think you were staggered when you took a look at that page to see how many languages on each of these. And then I have, of course, two of them are already on audio. So you can go to Audible and you can listen to Boudicca. You can listen to Catherine. And Richard Mann is recording... Empress Wu for Audible right now. And we should have that out sometime before the spring. All right, excellent. So there'll be yeah, give three us, audiobooks coming. Give us, your web, <laughs> give us your website name now, and we'll grab it again later so folks can start to think about that. You can do it one of two ways, laurelarockefeller.com, just my full author name, laurelarockefeller.com, or if you want to be British about it, laurelarockefeller.co.uk. There you go. You got you covered, folks. Now, um, music, I see that on your website, plays an important part in your work. Tell us why that's important to the writings of these books. Very difficult childhood, shall we say. And I started off as a singer-songwriter. I didn't know how to deal with what was around me, so I started making up songs. And I was making up songs and doing poetry and all that, probably from about the age of three. So long before I learned how to read and write. And I think it's just natural for a singer to, to bring this into, in, into the books. Uh, the Beers of Nine, which is my science fiction series, has a number of original songs. Go to my website. You'll get to hear all of those original songs I still have the melodies for. And then naturally, I was a, I was a medieval reenactor for a number of years with the Society for Creative Anachronism. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of that familiarity with the Tudor music and, and all of that comes from. And so naturally, Mary Queen of the Scots, the Forgotten Reign, and Queen Elizabeth Tudor, Journey to Gloriana, have a lot of music in it. But there's also music in many of the other ones. Matter of fact, since I was an Asian specialist, my historical fiction romance, my, uh, the Arban and the Saban, has a medieval Chinese song in it, which I am quite familiar with. It's called Spring and the Loyang. And if you really look on YouTube, you can hear me have a very botched performance of, of Spring and Loyang, you know, translating to another language. And you know what, inevitably with any actor, performer, what is going to happen? Sometimes you have a bad day, you completely blank <laughs> your lyrics. So I had that embarrassment. Uh, I think I have the link to, to that video up on my pin, on one of my Pinterest boards. But yes, I'm dressed in, and I'm having this sort of comp music competition and I can lay my blanket. <laughs> so, I mean, I had no idea. See, I'm, I'm bashing because I'm not looking at the lyrics. I'm not thinking about it. But there's nothing like starting your note on a high F. I broke my nose that morning on the way. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you know, every actor and every singer can relate to this. Oh my and God. I just had one of those <laughs> They tell you to, <laughs> they, they tell you to break a leg, not break a nose. Oh, but you took it the wrong way. Hopefully, you might want to sing a little portion of uh, from Queen Elizabeth Tudor. Is that uh, okay to ask you to do that now? 
Oh, please. I love doing that. All right. This is one of my holiday songs. We'll probably talk about the holidays a little bit later. But this is one of the holiday songs. Most Christmas carols go to the Victorian era. They don't really go before that. But this is a song that was sung most likely in Queen Elizabeth's court, and it's called Drive the Cold Winter Away. This is the one verse. There's more in the book. All hail to the days that there is more praise than all the rest of the year. And welcome the nights that double the night, as well for the poor as the dear. Good fortune attending to marry man's friend, that talk for the best he may. Forgetting all wrongs with carols and songs to drive the cold winter away. Oh, thank you for doing that. And that's when Princess Elizabeth is singing that as she plays the virginal you talked about that she inherited from her mother, Anne Boleyn, yeah, on Christmas Day. So holidays, you mentioned that earlier, and I want to just touch on that for a bit because holidays seem to play an important part of your work as well. Why is that, and what do you think it does for the story? I think that at its heart, Holly's come into it because I'm a December kid and my birthday always, always, always gets confused with Hanukkah, Christmas, Yule, everything else that's going on. So there's a little bit of, if you can't beat it, join it kind of thing. <laughs> but I think the other thing is I just like holidays. You know, there's kind of fun aspect to it, whether you're talking about Saturnalia, which is in Hepatia, yep. Passover, Hanukkah. Those are all in Hypatia of Alexandria. Christmas, of course, factors into the European biographies. Chinese New Year is in Empress Wu Zijian. It's just fun. I mean, who doesn't want to show fireworks in February, you know? Right, right. And I think it also, again, it, it speaks to what you do so well, and that drives home the feeling of the people and the story and the times and really brings the people to life. So I want to talk a bit about these women because... You know, I think the big the big question is we look to the past and we hopefully learn from them. And you told the story about ruling the country and, and has all these children. How are women today the same? Have we learned? Have we grown? Are we different? Let's just talk about that for a bit. I don't think women have fundamentally changed, but I think our legal status and our medical technology has changed dramatically. You want to go back to Queen Victoria. Uh, I am a fan of the show Victoria, which is on Masterpiece PBS if you're in the United States. And poor Queen Victoria had no, we didn't have the technology back in Victoria's time to know how to plan our pregnancies. So she had, I think it was nine children in the span of 10 or 11 years. And she was desperate to control her body and she couldn't do it. They didn't have the information. They did not have the technology. So she had child after child after child. She went through postpartum depression. She had all these issues about it. We shouldn't have today. And I say shouldn't because as we probably know, if you're a well-educated person or maybe not as educated, you live in the certain parts of the country, you know that poor, poor women and women of color especially in certain states in the United States, tend to have very high maternal and very high infant mortality rates. We have the means to make pregnancy and childbirth and the first year of life fairly safe. And yet in the United States, it seems to be about what your resources are and what the color of your skin is and not about what's possible. I don't think any rich woman in the world has any fear. Well, I shouldn't say that entirely. There are certain other factors. Um, one of the tennis players uh, was a Verena, Serena or Venus Williams. I'm sorry, I'm not a tennis fan. I don't know. But she had that issue where she almost died in childbirth. But for the most part, wealthier women don't have to worry about dying in childbirth, which was always an issue in the past. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have our civil rights issues, too. Women couldn't vote. They couldn't leave ab abusive husbands. They had no rights. One of the things that goes, and we'll go back to Queen Mary Stewart, Queen Mary Stewart, you may not realize, was an abused, she was a, a battered wife. She was severely abused by Lord Darnley. That's why she and some of her allies decided to have Darnley murdered because he was so abusive. He beat her. And here she is, the sovereign of a country, and she is trapped in the marriage. She can't leave, and she's being being to a pulp. And what has changed, and we must fight so hard to keep this, and we're not fighting hard enough. We must 
fight for our legal rights. We should not be allowing men to kill us because I have a bad day. We should not be dying in childbirth because of how much money we have. Back in, in the, the, the times where a lot of these women were living, they had no choice. We have it now. So I would hope and pray that we can do something about this because it's just a travesty when we see someone dying in childbirth because she doesn't have money. Mm-hmm. That's just wrong. No, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're speaking my language right. now. My, my primary passion and work is as a patient advocate, and you still do see women uh, dying in childbirth. And, you know, there are a lot of patient safety issues that are still out there and hospital safety issues and people you know, getting uh, diseases and infections and dying in hospitals when they don't have to. So you, know, you and I both, I think, agree on the mantra of speaking up, you know, become educated and then speak up about it. But and vaccines is another thing. I mean, how many women didn't die because of vaccines? Cancer is a big one. Uh, Matilda of England, her husband, Kaiser, Kaiser Heinrich V, died of an unknown cancer. He died fairly young. And we have the means to treat cancer now. So it should stop being about money and be about what's technologically possible. We shouldn't be dying of smallpox or chickenpox or, or any of these diseases that we thought we eliminated. It's just absurd. You didn't have the choice a thousand years ago. We do now. We should be using these vaccines and using this technology to save lives. All right. Well, good answer to that question. And I know I obviously from your tone that there's a whole lot more we can talk about, but maybe we need to save that for another time. <laughs> ah, you are a wonderful, wonderful person. Laura, we focused mostly on your history books, your women of history books. Before we wrap up here, I want to just give our listeners just a brief look at some of your other titles because you are extremely well-rounded and I want to share that as well. Well, the legendary women of world history, of course, you know the eight titles. Uh, Cleopatra the Seventh is my work in progress. I hope to have that out by November. We'll see. You and I will have a conversation shortly after that comes out, I'm sure. Uh-huh. But then uh, the original book series, I, start, I started as a science fiction writer, which Ooh. I think was really shock people. Yes. And I started off with, so, with social science fiction because at the time, and I uh, started on the Great Succession Crisis, I believe, early 2011. So I've been published for six years now. 2012 is when it came out. And I started off in that direction because I didn't know if we could have a civil discussion about the issues without people getting offended. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about things like mixing politics and religion and does this make an issue when when we talk about terrorism. The ghost of the past is a big thing about terrorism. And asking that question, does religion matter when it comes to a terrorist bombing a hospital. Does that matter? I wanted to talk about abortion. I wanted to talk about domestic violence. I wanted to talk about all these things. And I wasn't quite sure how to talk about it without getting on people's toes. Mm -hmm. So when you set something in another galaxy, it's much easier to do that. And one of my role models on that, of course, was Gene Roddenberry in Star Trek, Mm -hmm. which I've been at. I've loved Star Trek since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And I think Gene Roddenberry in Star Trek did that extremely well with bringing up the social issue, asking the questions. And by the way, none of the peers of my nine books judge. They don't tell you what to think. They just ask you through the plot right. to think. Yep. So there's goodbye, a, a six, my goodness, I have to ask you, now the number, I'm tripping over the numbers here. Goodbye, A672, E92, Quintus, The Poison Ground. And there's a darker version of that called the Poison Ground and the Healer Consort, which is more R-rated. I try to keep things PG-rated most of the time. <laughs> then the novel, The Great Succession Crisis, which is a wonderful clean romance that you could be happy for your 10-year-old daughter to read. You would completely, nothing objectionable in that. Or for parents who are concerned about explicit content, there is none. Ghost of the Past gets really dark. It's dystopian. But it covers a lot of these important issues like terrorism. And then Princess Anya Return brings it back and wraps up everything and has a nice little civil war to, to thrill you and, and make you happy. Then we get into, and of course I have a number of those adapted to play. That's another thing people don't realize. I've adapted most of my books for the stage. I saw that. So, yes, I saw that. Put on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Even sci-fi, you can do that. Uh, the Argon and Saban is 12th century uh, Jean Dynasty. The, uh, this is the time when you had the Jean Empire north of, I'm 
thinking, uh, I think it's north of the Changjiang, the Long River. Please don't quote me. I'm not looking at a map on this. But basically, you had the, you had the southern Song Dynasty, and then you had the northern China was the Qing Dynasty. The Mongols come and invade. Uh, Chinggis Khan, by the way, is not, is not Genghis. If you talk to a Mongol, they won't kill you. They, they won't kill you. They'll be very upset at you for saying it. It's actually pronounced Chinggis Khan. Good to know. Chinggis Khan united the Mongols in 1206. This happens in the 1211, shortly after the hordes are invading the Jin Empire. So it's a wonderful paranormal uh, wartime romance. You get all sorts of stuff. The Chinese, the Mongols, the New Jin, the Jurchens, uh, properly called the New Jin. And it brings it all together. It gets paranormal because I bring in the Asian mysticism. So there are some wonderful shamanistic elements. So shamanish, in English we call that shaman. So when, um, the Arban is a, uh, it's an officer within the Mongol horde. And the uh, shaman, the shaman is a shamaness. So you get that all sorts of fun stuff there. Of course, I have my guidebooks. The preparing for my first cockatiel, and I'm really surprised that Miss and I would have been so completely quiet while we've been recording. I heard them. Uh, they're not usually this quiet. <laughs> I heard a little peep oh. before. <laughs> yeah, I just heard I just heard Arwen chirp from the kitchen. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but that's a wonderful guidebook that gets into. I know we don't have time to talk about the cockatiel book, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book. But it basically, I've had birds in 1980. And I get into personal stories, and it shares a lot of personal photos, and I really get it, I take it real about getting a bird. And it's one of those nice guidebooks that doesn't get too technical. It just tells you what you need to know in order to get a bird. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, the legendary women of world history, and all the box sets, and all the languages, and a lot of fun. <laughs> but the website is really fun. I mean, it's not a typical book website. There's music. You can hear me sing. You can hear the 12th Doctor, Peter Capaldi, sing. There's Doctor Who music in there. There's all sorts of personal stories. There's backstories to everything. So I didn't have time to talk about all the backstories to all the different books, but there's backstories on the web. There's just a lot of fun stuff. So it isn't just a buy my book kind of author thing. There's just a lot of fun content, you know. If you're a Doctor Who fan, come to my website. You'll have, find something fun for Doctor Who, you know. <laughs> You are a scream. I love talking with you. There's just so much to know. Um, So you mentioned your website before. Is that the best place for them to buy your books or are there other venues you want to mention? Well, there's links to all the Kindle editions. And of course, with the Kindle, you can usually get to the paperbacks. But if you go on my website, at at the very beginning of the book section, you'll see links to my author pages on, I have it for Amazon, on Audible, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and Kobo, and Smash, Smashboard. Okay. So those are the big ones. Of course, you can get them at Books A Million as well, but your favorite retail will have my books, but those are the major ones, at least for Americans. Those are the major ones. Just go to the website, and you'll get to the author page, and you can get to all the links of all the books from there. All right, excellent. And the website, again, is laurelarockefeller.com. Well, any final words before we wrap up here? Well, if I could, if I could tell an aspiring writer or a new writer anything, mm-hmm. I would just remind them that this is a numbers game when it comes to making a living. If you have one book sold just for Kindle edition on Amazon, you will probably not sell that many. But the more books you have and the more different formats, so you want to have paperback and Kindle and the EPUB, which is what they use for, for the iBooks, and the audio, the more of it that you do and in the more languages, the more books you will sell. I mean, it's really, there's no magic bullet. Don't, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars in marketing. Just write a lot of books, put them in a lot of places, and you do, will do well if your work is quality. Oh, that's a great piece of advice. No one has really said that before, and it's very basic and simple, isn't it? So just keep, keep writing, keep doing what you love to do. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm-hmm. When I had just the Great Succession Crisis out, I didn't sell that many books. It's when I expanded it out. The wider you cast that net, the more you're going to catch. It's just logic. Yep. So it takes time to build up the number of titles and to get it published in all these different places and all the different languages. Absolutely. And you said one <clears throat> word, which I think is key. It's quality. So you don't want to just throw stuff out there. It needs to be quality work. <laughs> quality isn't there, it doesn't matter how many places you have. Yep. That, that's the other thing. You have, to, you have to work on your craft. I didn't put, I was, let's see, I published my very first book, and I published GSC in August of 2012, and I'm Gen X. 
So late 30s, early 40s is when I felt my craft was high enough. You're not going to do any chain what you do at 40. You just can't. You have to practice, 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 practice to get there. You'll never have the quality of 18 that you do at 40. For sure. It's like anything else. You need to practice and work on it. Yes, you're right. You're right. LaurelARockefeller.com. Well, as we close today, because we both loved sharing this time together, we are going to end with your recording of Diperte, Diperte. Did I pronounce that properly? Diperte, Diperte. Diperte. Nice Scottish. Okay, it's a Scottish love song from 1545 from the time of Queen Mary of Scots about the departing of two lovers. But before we do listen to that, I want to thank you so much for this important conversation today and my very best to you. And I think we're going to have to do this again. I think we should do it again. So how about sometime before Christmas? What do you think? I'm there whenever you are. Okay, great. Well, well, I'll see you in December then. Depart, depart, alas, I must depart. From her the half my heart with hurtful soul. Against my will indeed, and can't find no remed. I wake the pains of deep, can do no more. I weigh not well, I wander here and there. I weep and sighs right sad with pain is now must I pass away in wild and will some way. Alas, this woeful day we should depart. Ah, do sweet thing, my joy and comforting, my mirth and solace in all early glory. Farewell, my lady bright, and my remembrance right. Farewell, and have good night.